My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the solutions to any of the uh, any of these problems, you will find the original solutions to these problems from day number 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the middle of redoing the problems and we are on page number page number 283. Please turn to it. Page number 283, the very first problem on the page, problem number 90. Problem number 90 is a strange sort of creature. You'll see in a second why I say that. In problem number 90, they are asking us, is the time required to travel to travel d1 feet at r1 feet per second? Is this time that is required to make the journey of d1 feet at the speed of r1 feet per second, is this time greater than the time that is required travel d2 feet at r2 feet per second. So we're making two journeys, one is one we are told is d1 feet, the other one is d2 feet and their respective speeds are r1 feet per second and r2 feet per second. And the question simply is, does the first journey take less time or more time than the second journey? That's what it is. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they're telling us, in the first statement they're telling us that the first distance is 30 feet more than the second distance. They're telling us that the first distance is 30 feet longer than the second distance. Do you think that's enough by itself for us to ascertain whether or not the first journey will take more time or less time? Of course, the answer is no. How can we figure out if the first, first journey is going to take more time or less time simply by knowing that the difference in the two distances of 30 feet, that's not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we've established the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they tell us that the first speed is 30 more than the second speed. Again, simply knowing that you're going at a speed that is 30 feet per second more than the second speed is not enough to ascertain if the first journey is going to take more time or less time. It's not enough. Second statement by itself also does not do the job. The answer cannot be B. Let's put the two statements together and see if it gets if we get anywhere. When we when we put them together, when we put them together, this is where we have to slow down, this is where we have to take our time because we want to make sure that we contemplate all the possible, all the possibilities, all the possible scenarios. So let's see what we have here. We're going to look at just two scenarios and I'm going to show you what happens here. Two very simple scenarios. So let's start out with, here's our scenario number one. Let's, let's pretend, let's pretend that the second distance is 30 feet. But well, if the second distance is 30 feet, then the first distance would have to be 60 feet. Because we are told that first distance is 30 feet more than the second distance. Let's also pretend that the second speed is 60 feet per second. Well, if it's 60 feet per second, then the first speed would have to be 90 feet per second. So far, so good. So far, it's very simple. So now, if you look at this part here, to go 30 feet at the speed of 60 feet per second, you only require half a second. But over here, to go 60 feet, even though we are going 90 feet per second because of the fact that we have to go 60 feet, to go 60 feet at the speed of 90 feet per second would require two-thirds of a second. So does the first journey take longer time than the second journey? The answer here is yes. The answer here is yes. It does take a longer time. So that's one possibility. Now let's look at second scenario here. In the second scenario, we're not going to change too many things. We're just going to keep the distances are the same. We're going to keep the same distance of 30 feet. 
and therefore the first distance is 60 feet. We don't have to change everything. We just have to change one, one variable and see how it affects the entire picture. So let's just change the speed here. Instead of R2 being 60 feet per second, let's make R1, R2 be 30 feet per second. And as soon as we make R2 to be, uh, the speed, second speed to be 30 feet per second, you can immediately see what the problem is going to be here. Because if R2 is 30 feet per second, the R1 would have to be 60 feet per second. At 60 feet per second to go 60 feet will take exactly one second. At 30 feet per second to go 30 feet will also take exactly one second. Here, the two, two times are equal. It takes the same amount of time to make the first journey as it does to make the second journey. So to answer the question here, does the first journey require a longer time period than the second journey? In this scenario, the answer is no. Before, the answer was yes. So what do we conclude? We conclude that for us, that uh, the answer to the question that is being asked, does the first segment, does the first journey require more time than the second journey? The answer is maybe. Well, maybe means E. We do not have enough information. When we cannot give a definitive answer, that's answer choice E. We don't have sufficient data. Let's move on to number 91. Number 91. In number 91, let's see what we have. In number 91, we are dealing with a very straightforward arithmetic problem. That's all it is. It's not a very complicated one. It's a very straightforward one. We are told that the total amount of total total dollar of spent total dollar spent. Let's call it let's call it D for dollars. We are told the total dollar spent is 12,000. We are also told that we are spending this amount of money. The D dollar that we're talking about, we are spending it on three items. We are going to pay our mortgage with it, we are going to pay real estate taxes on the house with it, and we are going to pay for the insurance on the house. And those three items have to add up to $12,000. So far, so good. Let's see what they are asking. The question is very straightforward. The question simply is, how much is T? That's all it is. Let's see what they tell us. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that T plus I, T plus I equals one third of the mortgage. Simply knowing, simply knowing that the amount of money that we spend on real estate taxes and the amount of money that we spend on the insurance on the property, the sum of those two items is a third of the sum of the money that we spend on mortgage, does not enable us to ascertain what amount we must have spent on taxes alone. The first statement is not enough. The first statement is not enough. A D B C E. A D B C E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. I have to erase now, I have we have no choice because we need the room. In the second statement they tell us, in the second statement they tell us that the amount of taxes that we, that we are paying is 20% of the mortgage, of the money that we spend on the mortgage and the insurance combined. Well, let's see what they tell us. This is the same as saying, this is same as saying that the T equals one-fifth of the money that we spend on mortgage and insurance. Which of course, which of course is same as saying, if you were to multiply both sides by five, if you were to multiply both sides by five, it is saying, same as saying that five times the amount of money that we spend on taxes is same as the money that we spend on mortgage and insurance. Are you beginning to see where we are going with it? I hope you are. I hope you are. You see, by, by having this separate information about mortgage and insurance as one unit, now we can treat this as one variable. Treat this as X if you like. So now here is this one variable. We are no longer worried about the value of the mortgage and the insurance separately. All we are concerned about is their sum. And that's one variable. Tax, amount of money that we spend on taxes is our second variable. We have two variables and two equations. Here is our first equation, here is the second equation. Two independent equations to solve two unknown. Of course it can be done. 
The answer is B. Had it been real exam, we wouldn't do anything. That's it, we're done. Two independent variables, uh, two independent equations, two unknown. Of course it can be done. Just for learning purposes, I'm just going to take a few seconds to actually do it out. It's very simple, very easy. So M plus I is 5T. And we know that we know that 12,000, 12,000, we are told right here, 12,000 equals right here, which is M plus I plus T. You see? M plus I plus T. And M plus I we know is 5T. So this 5t plus t equals 12,000 and of course t equals 2,000 simple enough let's go to the next one the answer was b then let's go to the next one number 92 number 92 In number 92, we are told that A, B, C and D are positive integers. The question is, is A over B less than C over D? Now before we actually do any work, before we do actually do any work, are we able to appreciate are you able to appreciate the importance of this statement here? The fact that we are told that all of these integers are positive. They are positive integers. Is that, is that significant? The answer is very, very significant. Why? Because we are dealing with inequalities. And when you are dealing with inequalities, as you know, if you have an inequality and if you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, we have to worry about switching the direction of the inequalities. But if we know that these integers are positive, we don't have to worry about that. They have taken the complication out of it. We don't have to worry about it. We can multiply and divide all we want. The direction of the inequality will never change. So let's see what they can do. Let's, let's see what we can do. We have to answer this question. Is this ratio less than that ratio C over D? Let's see what they tell us. Well, in the first statement, in the first statement, they're telling us that 0 is less than C minus A over D minus B. Well, first of all, I don't like the way it is written here because we're not interested in zero. We're not interested in the fact that zero is less than this quantity. We, want to, we are interested in the fact that this quantity is more than zero. If zero is less than this quantity, then this quantity is more than zero. So we're going to write it like that. Sec next thing we're going to do is has, has absolutely no next thing that we're going to do is absolutely nothing to do with solving the problem. Actually, we could continue from here where we are. I'm just going to do it because it annoys me. I prefer to write the, uh, my, uh, my variable in alphabetical order. It looks better. So let's multiply, let's multiply the top and bottom by negative 1. And since we are multiplying top and bottom by the same number, we're not, we're not changing anything. We're just multiplying it by 1. That's all. So if you multiply it by negative 1, it becomes... So the, now the question is A minus C over B minus D, we are told, is positive. We are told that this has to be positive. That's, that's our information in the first statement. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's look at a couple of scenarios, shall we? Let's see what happens. In the first scenario here, in the first scenario here, here's our A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. Let's plug in 2, 3, 4, and 5. Let's just see what happens. What the hell? Let's just see what happens here. So A minus C a minus C, A is 2 minus C, which is 4, over B, which is 3, minus D, which is 5, and we end up with negative 2 over negative 2, which is a positive 1, and that of course is more than 0. So we have not violated what is being told to us, it is more than 0. The question is, what about this ratio here, A over B versus C over D? A over B, in this scenario, a over B would be 2 over 3. 2 over 3 and C over D, C over D would be 4 over 5. 4 over 5. Is 2 over 3, is 2 over 3 less than 4 over 5? Is 2 third less than 4 fifth? To which the answer is yes. To which the answer is yes. Now let's look at another scenario. Okay? Don't make it too complicated, keep it simple. So this time around, here's our A, B, C, D. 
before we did two, three, four, five, I'm just going to switch the direction. Five, four, three, two. I'm just going to switch the directions. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll just see what happens, okay? And if if uh, if uh, this thing does not work out, we'll fix it. Let's just see. Just to switch it. Don't make too much fuss about it. So same thing again. We're looking at first of all we have to, first of all we have to confirm that this this thing is still is still positive. But we have to first confirm that that these numbers work. We cannot violate that part. That's what we told in the first statement. We cannot violate that. This quantity, this ratio has to be positive. Let's confirm it here. So C, which is three. 3 minus, oh, I shouldn't I should be looking at C, we're looking at, we're looking at this thing right here. I'm going to erase this thing altogether. I hope I did not mess up here. A was 2, C was 4, that's right, A minus C. We are working with this one. Let's erase this thing altogether. We no longer need it, so it doesn't confuse us. And B was, B was 3, and that's right, this is right. So let's do it here. So we're looking at A minus C, A minus C over b minus d, b minus d, and we get 2 over 2, which is positive, which is which works. Now let's see what happens with the ratios, okay? This is this is the crucial part, watch what happens. So a over b in this case, a over b is going to be 5 over 4, and c over d, c over d in this case, c over d in this case is going to be 3 over Two. Is is five over four less than less than three over two? The answer is yes. Five five four is less than because this is same as six four. The answer is yes. Five four is less than six four. Oh, that's not a good news for us. That's bloody hell. We're looking for contradiction. This thing is a mess. We have to go back and fix something. What we have to do is make this one. See before. Before a over b was less than c over d. Somehow we have to make this guy bigger. I need a bigger number on the top. Tell you what, I have an idea. Instead of a five, instead of a five, I'm going to do it in a different color so you can actually see the changes we're making. Instead of a five, why don't we make the bloody thing 15? And let's just see what happens. If we make it 15, this is 15. Let's just make sure it, this is 15. A over b. So this would have been 12. See, if a is 15, then 15 minus 3 is 12. 12 over this thing, and this is still positive, 12, 12 over 2 is still positive, it is still positive, that works, and now it is 15 over 4, 15 over 4, and this is still 3 over 2, C is 3, D is 3 over 2, and here is 15 over 4 less than 2 thirds, the answer is no, it is not, so here the answer was yes, now the answer is no. As you can see, for all this work, and it turns out that the first statement is bloody no good. The first statement is no bloody good. Bloody hell is exactly what I, I said. That's exactly my sentiment. Let's look at second statement, shall we? First statement was no good. A, D, B, C, E. Now that you establish that the first statement by itself is no good, the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. We need the room. I need a lot of room, but first I'm going to get out of the way so that you can have a clear view for a second. That's just my polite way of saying I'm a baby and I need my break. Let's look at second statement. Second statement, we are told that a, a, a times d, a d over b c squared is less than a d over b c. But that's actually quite straightforward. This is simple algebraic manipulation is all it is required here. We don't have to do plug in any numbers here. Let's open this thing up. Let's open this thing up so we can write this thing as we can write this thing as a d squared over b c squared. We see a b c here. We see a b c here. We can we can we can multiply both sides of the equation by b c. So that's what we're going to do here. So we have a a d times a d over b c times b c. I'm I'm doing it in a very babyish way. I don't know why. I shouldn't have to do it in such a babyish way. If you multiply both sides by BC, if you multiply both sides by BC, what do you find? 
I need, I need, I have this urge to be dramatic here, so I'm going to pick up a new marker. If we multiply both sides by BC, this BC drops out, and one of the BC from dropout is from here. Oh, we still have to divide both sides by AD. And we can divide both sides by AD. This BC is going to drop out. I think we are done. We, we can multiply both, we can divide both sides by AD. We can divide both sides by AD. The reason I'm getting confused is because I'm making it too much of a babyish way. I didn't want to do it this way. It's too simple. It's, it's too simple. Well, I'm just going to do it. Okay, watch what happens. If you, if you divide both sides by AD, this becomes, this drops out and that goes away. If you divide, multiply both sides by BC, BC is going to go over and this drop out of it. And what we end up is, AD over BC is less than 1. AD over, B, AD over BC is less than 1 is what we're going to get at the end here. This is going to drop out here. And AD over BC is less than, see th this AD is going to drop out with this AD. AD over BC is less than, on this side we're left with 1. And, and let's see what, what happens with that. So what we end up here is AD AD over BC is less than 1. And now we can multiply both sides by BC. We can multiply by, by both sides by BC without having to worry about switching the direction of the inequality because we are told from the very beginning that all of these uh, integers are positive. And this BC is going to drop out and what we end up is AD is less than BC. And what was the question? What were they asking in the question? Do you remember? What was the question asking? The question was asking is Oh, we're not quite done here because they're looking for the ratio. Let's, let's do one more step. Erase all of this thing. So, this, this implies that if you multiply both sides by B, if you multiply both sides by B, B is going to drop out and A over B, and multiply both sides by D, and this D to drop out and we're going to end up with C over D. There you go. That's what it tells us. It tells us that the ratio of AB to BC, ratio of AB is less than the ratio of D, A, CD. So the question was, is this true? The second statement clearly tells us that yes it is. Second statement clearly tells us is that yes it is. But I made a mess of it because I, every time I try to show all the baby stuff, it, it makes a bloody mess out of it. It's very simple, very straightforward. That's all. The answer is yes. Second statement does the job. Second statement does the job and therefore the answer is Therefore, the answer is B. The first statement did not do anything. Let's move on then, otherwise we'll be here forever. Let's go to the next one, 93. I want, I want to finish this column, 93. Or perhaps we should stop this. It's been a very long video as it is. Uh, let's stop here. I'm going to stop here. We're going to do, we're going to do 93, 94. 95 and 96 together because 96 is a nasty one and then in the following video we'll do 97, 98, 99 and 100. I was planning to do this whole page in two videos. It's better if we do it in three videos because it gets to be too long. Do you understand? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.